it's my pleasure to be here to give you a presentation about uh, the field framework uh, we have been working on. Um, actually, Kevin is also a very um, important contributor to the uh, framework. And uh, um, so in this demo, we will use native Python plus few to quickly prototype the Walmart time series forecasting project. I just want to confirm that everyone can see my share screen, right? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so we are going to demonstrate uh, how to think and solve a problem in a scale agnostic way. And uh, we will also demonstrate how Fugue can orchestrate your code in a framework agnostic way. In this demo, we don't want to create a perfect model to beat anyone. And it's not a place to compare Pandas, Spark, or Dask. Because with Fugue, you can choose any of them. So let's start. First of all, uh, let's install uh, Fugle. Fugle is a package um, providing convenient interface for Kaggle users uh, to use Fugue. If you are on the notebook, you can actually run it um, at the real time. Um, and I have I have already uh, I've already finished the installation, so I will just uh, skip this uh, step. To uh, to uh, set up the environment, we only need to import and run setup. It will uh, predefine the output of few uh, data frames. And it will also provide the Fugue SQL highlight inside the notebook. We will see that in the following sections. OK, so now let's import everything for this demo. OK, now we start. Um, the uh, data exploration. First of all, let's take a look at the calendar data in the Walmart uh, project. As you can see, there are many different columns. And in this demo, we will focus on three columns, the date, the week, and the D. So week will be used uh, to process the price data, and the D will be associated with the sales data to process the sales data. We'll see that in the following steps. So in order to make this data frame more uh, pandas friendly, we write some native pandas code. Recalling there, we just read the CSV and then we set uh, the index, uh, set data and, and as the index and then return. Um, and then we get the start and date of this calendar. Uh, of this calendar data set. It's just native Python, uh, nothing special. Okay, now let's uh, switch to price data. What does this look like? As you can see, um, price data also has this week uh, column and uh, it's associated with this week column here in the calendar. So what we want to do is uh, we want to join this data frame with calendar um, data frame so that uh, we can get a data frame, a time series of, um, of date and the sell price uh, for each of the product. And as we can see here, uh, the store ID and item ID will determine one product. And here we probably have many products. So after drawing the two data frames, we should get a collection of many time series. As you can see, the number of rows here um, is about 6 million. And so that our estimate is that after joining um, with the calendar data, it will be over 40 million rows here. Okay, so now assume we have already joined the data to two data frames 
and we get a collection of time series, right? And uh, um, so let's focus on a single product. Assuming we have a subdata frame that already contains one and only one um, product um, state of uh, uh, time series. And what we want to do is uh, we want to see uh, if we can um, if we can transform that sub data frame into a single row that will have a column uh, representing the series, the price series. Right? So again, this is just a very simple Python function. As you can see, when we're taking a, a data frame, which we assume this data frame repre represents one and only one product uh, of the original data frame, and we only need to get uh, the keys of the data frame, and then we just assume that, or we just uh, assert that the data frame is sorted by, uh, by date and it's continuous. So this assertion will uh, assert it's sorted and continuous. And then we will just uh, um, return a single row as the output where we have all the, uh, we have the store ID, item ID, and the date, uh, and the start date, as well as a list of the sale price in that subdata frame. So we convert each subdata frame to a single record, right? So this is the transformation. Let's run this. And here is just a small testing code. As, as we can see, everything is expected to, uh, we have a mock data frame where we have date and sale price. And after the transformation, it becomes a single row, a single um, dict in the list, right? Each dict is a, is a row and we have only one dict in the list. Okay, so the idea is since we have already figured out how to process each of the subdata frame, how can we apply this to the entire data frame and to all the products? And then um, we are able to process um, the entire um, price, uh, price data set, right? So before we do that, let's make some cosmetic change to this original function to make it more expressive. As you can see from this function, actually in, inside, the, inside the function, the code was not changed. We just added a few lines of uh, comments, right? So the first comment said, okay, I want to make sure this data frame has contains date and the sale price columns. And also I want to make sure this data frame is already partitioned by store ID and item ID. And this data frame will only represent one partition of the entire data frame. And we also want to assert that the input data frame is already sorted by date so that we don't have to sort the data inside this pandas data frame. And we also want to tell you that the output of this function is in this schema. As you can see, it's store ID, item ID, price uh, start date, and then prices as a list of doubles. And these two values will construct a continuous time series for prices. As you can see, this is a purely cosmetic. We didn't change anything on the function. It is still native and it's still only using pandas and it's still highly testable, right? So the result is the same, but the difference is we call these hints for few. So, and this function has become a field extension while it is still uh, native uh, Python. Right, so when you write this, write uh, your code in this way, Fig will be able to identify by your uh, type annotation that you want the input to be in the format of pandas data frame, and you want the output to be in the format of a list of dict. So it will provide you 
the sub data frame independent data frame um, format, and it will also um, convert your output to the the Fuchs uh, internal structure. But as long as you give the uh, standard type uh, annotation, Python type annotation, Fuchs will be able to know how to how to handle this function and how to distribute this function. And also all these hints are useful to Fuchs. So Fuchs is able to do the schema validation, do the input data validation, as well as uh, Fuchs is able to um, output, uh, I mean, convert this list of dict into a sub data frame in this schema. So I think in this way, you still keep your code native, but on the other hand, um, it's a lot more expressive and the, the code itself is still portable. You can still use it anywhere you want. And also it's, um, it becomes a Fugue extension. Right, so this is, um, this is why we say that Fugue adapts to users uh, because you only need to write native Python code with uh, a type annotations and schema hints. And then Fugue will be able to use that directly in Fugue workflow. Okay. So now let's start writing the first um, Fugue workflow using your extension. So here is the workflow logic. Here is the workflow logic. What you do is you define a DAG directly a cyclic graph, which is uh, actually the underlying type is Fugue workflow. Um, you can find that uh, in the Fugue repository. And you load the data from cell prices and the calendar, right? As we discussed above, um, we just want to get these two data frames and then we want to join them, right? We want to inner join them. And when you load the data, you tell Fig that, okay, both of them have header and both of them, we need to infer schema for them. So that int become a, a int column be, becomes an integer column. I mean, a numerical column uh, becomes a numerical column. It's no longer a string. And to make it even safer, we want to alt columns using, for example, cell price to double. So if in case cell price is all integer and with this alt columns, make sure that cell price is in double type. And also here, we also alt columns to make sure that date is in date column. Because think about that, this workflow is going to run with different computing engines. It can run on Pandas, it can run on Spark, it can run on Dusk. And different computing engines, they, they may infer the schema uh, in different ways. There may be inconsistency. So here the, alt, uh, the alter columns will make sure that the, the important columns are totally consistent uh, and uh, that is independent from your computing engines. Okay, so when you join this to um, data frame, they will join by the common column, which is the weak column we see before. And then after you join, we want to pre-partition by store ID and item ID because these two columns will define a product and then pre-sort by date. All these are correspondent to these two assertions. Uh, sorry, to these uh, 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 two assertions. You must have these two. So what if you don't have this partition by clause? This function will fail immediately um, before even running anything. So this is called a compile time failure. Um, so if you uh, separate the DAG, uh, the DAG definition and the DAG execution and try to push a lot of um, potential errors to be captured at the compile time, that means when you construct a DAG and when you don't have this partition by, it will fail immediately without even running this so that you can quickly capture any um, issues, I mean, I mean, careless issues uh, before even running this with uh, large scale data. I call this fail fast 
uh, which uh, I think practically in my work is super useful. Okay, so this is in general the, um, the workflow that we want to use to process the original uh, data set into a price series packet, where the price is already in the format of a list of doubles. And I have already run this DAG using no parameter, meaning that I just want to use, I, run, I want to run this DAG using pandas as the execution engine. If I want to run this using Spark, I just uh, do this. And uh, you don't have to change anything in the DAG definition. You only change your execution engine and it will run without a problem. And the result is consistent, will be consistent. And notice that the Kaggle machine is pretty, uh, how to say, it? it's, it's not powerful. So sometimes you don't see Spark is running faster than Pandas. But if you really have hundreds of machines, and sometimes um, you will see this is significantly faster if you're running that with a Spark execution engine. The point here is not to compare which execution engine is better. The point is that Fugue makes, it's just an option. You can choose whichever execution engine you want to run while you don't have to change your code. Okay, so while this is running, I want to see if you guys have any questions regarding the, the workflow definition and the, the extension that I call this transformer, the transformer desk definition. Okay, so I guess uh, um, then let's just uh, move to the next uh, section. Sales. Now we start to process the sales data set. So um, since this is still not finished, I guess it will take uh, maybe like uh, five minutes to finish, I guess. And we can continue just talk to talk about the data sets. And for the sales uh, evaluation data, it's much simple to process. Um, this table is a very big fat table. It has several thousands, uh, no, uh, I think over 1,000 columns. And each column represents, oh, it finished. Uh, it, it just finished. Um, so it finished in six minutes. Uh, actually, if I run this in our own environment using Spark, it can finish under one minute. So, but you don't have to change anything, yeah. Uh, now let's take a look at the train evaluation data set. As you can see, we have D1 to D like a, uh, like a 19th, uh, 1900, right? So we have almost 2000 columns and we have 30,000 rows. Again, this is not, uh, you know, um, if you are processing data, this is not a friendly data frame because it has too many columns. Sometimes too many columns can generate problems. So we want to process this data frame in a similar way. We want to merge all these columns, D underscore columns into an array of integer as the time series. And also we gave a start date. So to do the same, here is the same, but the process is much easier than price. So as you can see that we just read in the calendar and then we just have, uh, for example, um, uh, we, we get the start date uh, for, uh, because for each record, they always start from D1, right? They always, so, so every each record, uh, the start date is always the same. 
So here we just get the start date and for each row of, uh, of a data frame, we just uh, take the first six columns, first the six columns and then plus two additional two columns. One is the start date and another is the list of the rest of the columns. And the output, the output schema will be ID, item ID, department ID, cat ID, store ID, state ID, plus a start in data, for, uh, in data type and the sales, which is an array of integer. And as you can see that the signature of sales to series is different from um, this transformer, which is pandas data framing and the list of dict out. And here for this transformer, the input becomes an iterable of list, right? And the output is also a list, li uh, iterable of list. Right? So that's the flex, that's the flexibility that you can provide. So you have the option to write the input types and output types in different formats as long as you provide the type annotation, Fig will still treat this as an extension, as a transformer. And it will also provide the data type according to your type annotation. And you should choose the best type for the particular method that makes sense to you. So for example, for this, for the previous one, we want it to be a pandas data frame because we want to take advantage of, um, for example, uh, how, how the data frame, uh, for example, the, the shape, right? And then we want to get the, uh, the, the, the date. And uh, we also want to get the, the list of a column. So that's why we think the pandas data frame is the best fit for this function. But for this function, there, it has nothing to do with pandas. It just, the, the most native, the most native uh, data structure is the best fit for this problem. So just to use the most native data structure and just uh, to express your logic in the most intuitive way. And uh, uh, Fugue will take care of the type conversion and other things. And the, the workflow to process the sales data is also much simpler. As you can see, we just load the data and we want tell you uh, we have header and you need to infer the schema. And then we just uh, transform without any partition because I don't need partition because each row of this data frame will be processed independently and then saved to a file. So in contrast with the save sales uh, series, and uh, um, this one is much more complicated because we need to join and we need to partition the data frame before transform because this transformer is applied on the logical partition that you defined here. And for this function, you don't need a logical partition. You just let the underlying computing framework to partition the data for you because it doesn't matter how you partition the data for this one. So, um, so give you an example, these two transform, although you see them in the same format, but actually if you run that in Spark, they will be quite different. So if, if you want to express the same logic in Spark, they will be drastically different for df.transform or df.partition by and transform. Um, the partition by and transform will be much, much more complicated to implement in Spark. But again, we unified everything, we simplified everything in Fugue so that you can just express them in a very consistent and uh, simple way. And we will translate your logic into the, uh, uh, to run on the underlying execution engines. As you can see, the save, uh, the save sales series will run in just uh, maybe one minute and finish. So now we have sales series done and we have price series done. And you can see that price is 
an array of in, uh, array of uh, uh, double and sales is an array of integer. And their common uh, columns are item ID and the store ID. So if you join these two together, you will get for each product, you will get two series. One is sales, one is price. So naturally the next step will be merging this two data frame into one data frame and merging this two time series to have the same start date and end date. Right? So that we are able to process, uh, process them together. So think about that, why we want to merge them? Because in most cases, for each product, we, we, want to pro, uh, we want to process things per product. So for each product, it's better that all the data is together so that we can process them together. And again, this is the logic to, pro, uh, to merge the series. So given that, assume that this two data frame is already joined. And for each product, we already have two series. How can we merge that two series into one, uh, into one data frame? As you can see, this one, uh, we use a wild schema, a uh, wildcard schema. That means um, the join data, uh, the, uh, for each of the uh, row of the join data frame, we keep the original schema. And then we add an additional column called series binary. That is the merged uh, data frame. And then we uh, serialize that in a binary blob. And also we want to minor sales price, price start. So we want to exclude these three columns in the output data frame. So that it becomes you know, slimmer and because these uh, columns are no longer necessary after this merge, right? So here is the same. Um, we can define, uh, so this data frame is about sales. So this, this is to get the sales uh, into a pandas data frame. I mean, for each row, for each product. And this is to get the price as a series, pandas series, and to be integrated with the quantity column, right? And then we get, um, then we, um, we just get um, the, the merged um, pandas data frame. Um, we use pickle to dump, dump it into a binary blob. And then we set the start date to be the first uh, date of the data frame. So the question is why we want to pickle, why we want a ser uh, we, why we want a binary blob. This is because when you process things locally on a single machine, it's okay. Probably you can just make this series a pandas data frame. But think about that. You want to write scale agnostic code. You want this function to run not only on your machine, but in a cluster, right? So if you want to do that, you will need to move the data around. And the best way to move data around is to use a general type data type to move data around. And the binary blob is actually the best solution for that. So if you serialize that to a binary blob, it can move around and the type is also general enough. Serialize and deserialize this data blob is also simple. And in the following example, you will also see that not only we can uh, pickle a pandas data frame, we can also pickle a NumPy array. So the binary is a general type that is quite useful for distributed computing. Or in other words, um, the binary blob is quite useful for writing a scale agnostic, frame agnostic, um, uh, I mean, framework agnostic code. And here you can see that with the merge series, we also write some testing code to make sure that uh, it is giving the expected result. That means uh, actually a unit test. And then this is the logic to run the workflow. You read C uh, sales uh, and the price parquet, and then you just inner join them because they will inner join them 
by the common uh, columns, which is the store ID and the cat ID. And then you want to partition um, with num16. Th this is actually to control the concurrency of the computation. Uh, if you are using, if you run this in pandas, it doesn't matter. No matter what, uh, what number you give, it doesn't matter. But if you run that in Spark or some other things, you can control uh, the concurrency of the execution. Uh, but sometimes it's not necessary. So actually you can just remove it. It, sh it shouldn't matter. Um, and then you transform using this merge series, right? You merge this series on join the data frame and then save. It's the, it's the same. Okay, so for this one, <clears throat> we want to write on Spark. As you can see, it's as simple as just specifying, okay, I want to run this on Spark. If you remove this, it will run on Pandas. But if you specify this, the workflow now is running on Spark. And while you run on Spark, you will see that the CPU usage is a lot higher than 100%. Why? This is because when, even in the local mode, when you, run on, when you run on Spark, you will try to fully utilize all your uh, CPUs. And the Kaggle actually has four CPUs for each of the virtual machine. So actually by using Spark, you actually fully utilize the Kaggle machine. If you use Pandas, you will always see, okay, it's about 100%. But for this one, you see, it's 400%. Actually, it's using, fully utilizing the four CPUs here. So that means Fugue can make your code run without changing uh, on, on different frameworks without changing your logic. You just specify the underlying execution engine. So, okay, so far, do you have uh, any questions? Okay, so let me continue. Okay, now, Again, we're using the native pandas to look at the data that we just generated, the series by K. I'm waiting for that to finish. So it takes a while, I think maybe two minutes. Uh, it's still processing. And now we switch to training. So um, after we get this, uh, I finish in two minutes. And after we get the series parquet, right? As you can see, this is just one example. This is just one example of the time series, quantity and price, right? For each example. With this series data, now we start to think about training. So the first question is, given a single time series, how can we generate the training data and the validation data? So this function, this native Python function is to solve that problem. So given this series, this example series, and given the end of training date, and the training period and the test period and some other parameters, how can you generate that training data? So I'm not going to go into any details, but uh, it's, it's just a, a um, native way that uh, to generate uh, uh, the training, uh, the X, right? And Y, they're both, uh, because it's a series to series, uh, the tr both, both the training data and the label are series. It's just a longer, a longer, uh, a longer series versus a, a shorter series. And you can see that uh, the longer, so here for this example, I want the training period to be three and test period to be two. So the training input has three and uh, the test period has two. 
right? So this is this is just a, a, a native example. And then with this uh, training uh, training data generator for each series, we we now start to think, okay, if we get um, an iterable of these series or the, the, the input from the series data, how can we generate the training set? Right, so here, uh, so given that, uh, given a data frame, right, given a data frame containing many different series, and what we want to do is we just iterate through these rows, and then we, for each of the row, we generate, we get a series, right, we get a series, and then we just uh, generate the training set from this row. And then we append to x, y validation and truth. And in the end, we just, uh, uh, we just uh, concat all of the x and all of the y and the validation and truth to be uh, several uh, bigger NumPy uh, array. So for the final training step. So this function is again, a fugue extension. And we want to have some logical uh, assertion on that. So for example, we want to assert that um, it's partitioned by cat ID and state ID. Why? So here, let me explain my idea for this training problem. So given that we already have the series data, uh, I'm thinking that um, intuitively, um, for different category ID and for different state, that group of product should have its own pattern, right? So the time series should have its own pattern. So intuitively, I'm thinking, what if I can just, uh, for each category and the state combination, I can train a separate model. So for here, for this data set, we have three different categories and three different states. So actually for this data set, we train nine different models for nine group of data. Why I want to group them? Because I think for each group, they have their own character, they have their own property, and uh, it should have their own, um, um, you know, um, like a, a time series pattern. So I think to separate, to train the, uh, uh, and, the and I think they, they do not have a much connection between each other. So I think to train those models separately um, will probably give better result because each of the data set is more focused on some certain things instead of like a everywhere or what I mean in a data set it, otherwise it can be too noisy so the idea is to partition the data by category ID and state ID and for each cat and the state uh, pair I train a special model and on the other hand because we know that we're going to run this distributedly um, on a cluster. So training nine models probably can be as uh, cheap as training just one of them. Because if you fully parallelize these, the training of these nine models, and then actually just uh, take uh, one training, uh, one, uh, one unit of time for training, right? So here is, here is how we generate the training set first. And then we uh, make sure that it's um, it's partitioned by cat and state ID. Okay, assume that we already have the training data generated. Now let's do the real um, like modeling work. Um, for modeling, so given that for each partition, for each partition that this, uh, for, for, for each partition that this generate training set uh, yields, um, I want to use two different models to evaluate, to train and to evaluate on the evaluation data set and to get an idea of the error, right? So here we use um, evaluate uh, linear regression and evaluate a neural network. Linear regression, I don't have to, uh, much to say. And for the uh, neural network, I just use a Keras, um, very simple Keras model where we just define like a, a three layers ReLU, ReLU, and linear, and we used MAE as a loss function, right? And the fit and the predict. And this evaluate model will take the output of this function 
And uh, for each of the output of that function, I will iterate through these two models and to train and to predict. And because uh, the input data frame is already grouped, for each, of the, for, for each row of the input data frame, it's actually a group of data. And they all have, and it's a group of IDs. So I just want to break it back into per product ID. So I just iterate through each row of the data frames and to get the evaluation score. And I can also get the IDs uh, for that row. So the output will be each product ID, category ID, state ID, plus the evaluation score and the evaluation method and also the merge the data frame uh, for ground truth and the prediction. So actually the training, so for each single product, we will train two models. For each single product, you will be able to see two records, right? And this is a logic for the training, for the training pipeline. Okay, as you can see, this is um, this is training right now. So actually, training right now. Also, uh, yeah, this is training right now. And let's take a look at the evaluate models, the workflow. First of all, we load the series data, and then we want to sample the data uh, if the sample is less than one. So we just, sometimes if you want to quickly prototype, we just take a sample of the original data and then to test your idea. So this is how we sample data. And then you just a partition by category ID and state ID. Using, for each partition, we generate the training set. After the training set is generated, again, we use the evaluate model to evaluate on the training sets, on the training data. And then we save the result to evaluation parquet. So this is generate, uh, get data, generate training data, and evaluation, evaluating models, three steps. And as you can see, when we run this in just using pandas, you will see that um, about nine Keras model is trained. And you can see that it's training right now. It's a deep learning. The training the deep learning model. Training the uh, linear regression model is totally silent, so we cannot see that. So actually, what we have done here is we're taking the data, and actually we have done param uh, param uh, sorry, I, I call it model sweeping, right? So for, for each of the data set, we evaluate with two different models. Actually, parameter sweeping is actually the same. So similar, you, you can do some very similar thing to do parameter sweeping. For example, you can just give some parameters here, and then we can iterate through um, eval LR with different parameters. And then you have model sweeping and parameter sweeping together. Right? It's, it's actually the same. So here, for simplicity, I will just sweep the models instead of sweeping the parameters. As you can see, everything finished in just one minute, uh, 56 seconds, so about two minutes. But I only trained on 10% uh, of the data because I just want to get a rough idea how they perform. All right. OK, so with the evaluation data set, now let's switch topic to my uh, favorite, uh, Fuge SQL. So Fuge SQL is a DSL for Fuge. It extends the standard SQL to be a real language. Um, so all Fuge extensions that we defined uh, previously, for example, this extension and these, uh, this extension, they all can be used directly in Fuge SQL. And all the workflows we defined previously can all be translated into Fuge SQL. And what I mean is you can represent the same thing in Fuge SQL in another way. So actually, it's just a different way to represent the logic. 
but uh, it can be very useful if your workflow has a big chunk of SQL logic or you heavily rely on SQL. And sometimes uh, the SQL mindset is also great for distributed computing. Because I think, in my opinion, I feel that SQL has the right level of abstraction to describe distributed computing. It is very scale agnostic. Uh, it's a framework ag agnostic, but um, it is very expressive. So that's why I say SQL, fig SQL is my favorite part. And here is how we set up the environment, uh, the, um, the Kaggle environment to use Spark as a default backend uh, for Fuchs SQL. So here is the first example of uh, how we use Fuchs SQL to uh, analyze the, in the, evaluation da uh, the evaluation data set that we have generated. Right? We have generated evaluation data set. OK, so no, let's run our first Fuchs SQL on Spark on Kaggle. Let's take a look at the logic. We load the evaluation packet, and then we don't want this column. This column is the is the binary blob, which we don't use in this in this cell. And then we print. We want to see what the data frame looks like. You can just print. You can see all these three statements. They are not standard SQL. They are extended parts. Uh, so as I said, Fuchs SQL extends um, the standard SQL. Uh, so it has extended syntax to make it more uh, like a language. Um, and then you can use the standard SQL. For example, this one, I will just group by cat ID, state ID, and method. And then to get the average score and the max score, right? Um, so as you can see here, this is the result. So for each category and state, and for each method, I can get the average score, R2 score, and the max R2 score. Right. This is, I think if you want to express the same logic in Pandas or in uh, Fuchs functional interface, it can be more tedious. But if you express this in SQL, you write minimal code to do what you want to do. OK, actually, not only this. Fugue SQL is also great for visualization. And you can group by data, you can group by certain things, and then visualize it. So let's run this function. As you can see, I want to compare, I want to compare for each category and state ID pair. Um, what are the best score? for linear regression and the best score for neural net, right? So you just have this select uh, group by statement. And then you just output using our built-in uh, fugue extension plot bar. And you define that the x axis will be ID and the title is best model. So you will see this chart here, right? So as you can see that uh, for food C CA, probably neural network is a little bit better. And for this household CA is equal, but otherwise linear regression is always better than neural network. It doesn't mean the neural network is not good. It's just because our neural network is not tuned at all. You need, for deep learning models, you need to spend a lot of time to tune your model, right? So it's just a start. It's just a framework that you can play with it. And then you can just tune, for example, you can tune your model or even you can add LSTM model here. And then you just keep running this and you will be able to get the, 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 anal the analytic results from here, right? So again, the point here is not to build a fancy model, a perfect model for this problem. It's just to show you a framework where you can extend. You can quickly write more um, models and uh, they will all be applied to your entire data set, right? And for the second statement, it's more interesting. What we want to do is uh, for, each, uh, for each category ID and state ID and, the uh, and state ID, I want to get uh, 
the uh, the better model. So because for each product we have we have two, right? We have two models and we have two scores. We always want to choose the uh, the one with the best score. So we use a window function here to select for each product. We we rank we rank the method, right? And here the second clause we just uh, select the first rank, the the best the best method the best record, right? And then we just sum them and group them so that we get this chart, where it means, for example, in food CA, uh, 150, uh, 100, for 150 products, uh, neural network is performing better than, um, than linear regression. But for 350 uh, products, linear regression model is performing better than neural network. And as you can see, again, linear regression is overall is better, a better choice. But for some certain combinations, for example, for hobbies, tax, Texas, and hobbies, Wisconsin, you can see that neural network may perform better than linear regression. Right? So last. In the end, you can also write your own extension to plot more interesting things. So for example, for this one, so given the evaluation results, I want to plot um, the ground truth versus the prediction. And what we do is we take, we want the data frame input as a list of dict of rows, right? And then we just, for each row, we generate the title and then we pickle load the data frame, which is a binary blob, and then plot, right? This is an extension. And this is also a native Python code, right? Now let's draw this. As you can see, what we want to do is we load the evaluation parquet and we load the top five, the best, perform, uh, the best performing uh, predictions, and then we plot the prediction versus um, the ground truth. And the orange is the prediction, and the blue is the ground truth. They all look great, right? But uh, they are the best ones. So what if we want to look at the wor worst ones? So it's very simple. You just uh, order by score in another direction, and then you will see horrible results. You see how, how bad it is, right? Okay, so I think this is in general what I want to present. Um, and the, the last thing I want to mention is that let's go through the previous uh, code. Um, actually, you can see that most of your code is already highly modulized. And the, the part that without, for example, without any dependency on fugue, they are all highly unit testable. Actually, we add a lot of tests in each cell, right? And they are just the functions, functions, native functions. And for the part where you have, you have to use fugue SQL, oh, sorry, you have to use fugue workflow. Actually, they are also highly testable. Why? Because no matter you're taking large data or smaller data, you don't have to change this stack. So what you can do, for example, you can just specify, make this two parameters. And then you can create your own mock data, which is quite small, and run them using the pandas backend. That can be used as a um, unit test. And then when this is ready, you can just simply switch the parameter to large data set and run with Spark. And that is large scale data set. So um, even the DAG itself is highly unit testable. So when you look at the entire code, um, it's all modulized and every piece of code is testable. There is nothing that's non-testable in this, uh, in this uh, demo case. So that's another uh, very important feature of Fugue is that it naturally makes your code uh, more testable.
and more portable. I think that is extremely important for production. Thank you. I think that's all I want to talk about today. All right. Uh, we'll open the floor for questions. And uh, I'll, I'll start. I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, for deployment, like, do you guys, like, sa save all these models? And then also for, like, prediction for this kind of problem, you would, like, load the appropriate model for the appropriate item state combination? Yes, we do. Uh, actually, the uh, model sweeping and parameter sweeping is one of the most important use cases inside uh, Lyft using Fugue. Um, we use this, we can, for example, we can sweep thousands of models in just 20 minutes and to get the best models. Uh, it's quite powerful and we can see significant uh, performance gain if you sweep the model. Because the problem is, um, if you want to train, uh, for example, uh, in my company, we have maybe many regions, right? We want to, for each region, we want to train a model, right? The problem is uh, you cannot give the same hyperparameter for each region. That doesn't make sense because the some regions are small, some regions are big. You need to, you need to optimize hyperparameters per region, right? So if we use the Fugue framework, actually it would do. We use the Fugue framework. So that means for each region, you do your own parameter sweeping um, and as well as model sweeping. So for example, uh, we probably will also sweep some deep learning model as, all, as well as a lasso model and uh, just a plan linear regression model. And uh, we will see that for different regions, we will have different model chosen and for even for the same model, we will have different hyperparameter chosen to optimize the performance. Yeah. Okay. And we do save the models. Uh, and the saving model is a different topic. Um, actually, that's more related how you serve model in a consistent, unified way. Uh, there are many ways. Um, the simplest way is we just uh, serialize that as a file and add an um, abstract, uh, abstract class that can uh, load, can predict, that's it, right? That's, that's how you abstract the model concept, right? But uh, uh, there are other ways, for example, container-based, uh, that's more advanced. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? I want to know if, um, could you talk a little bit more about how the schema comments work? I've never seen programmatic access to comments at runtime before. Uh, uh, what's your, you have never, what? Like, I've never seen any, I've never seen a library whose behavior changes based on code comments. Yes, yes. Um, actually, yes and no. Uh, actually for Python too. Um, you know, the type annotation was done by comments. That's official Python. So using Python, using comments to change the behavior of the function uh, isn't something new, but uh, it's not something that many people are using. You know, the benefit of using comments is that with comments, you don't have any dependency on the framework. For example, this code, you can write it anywhere, right? You can have a separate package containing this function, but not depending on Fugue at all. And then you can have another package using this package and then directly use Fugue to orchestrate this function run, right? So you totally, with, with this comments, you totally decoupled your code from underlying frameworks. It's not like Spark. I don't know how many people here are using Spark. Um, you will see that if you seriously, you want to use Spark, you will find that the dependency of Spark is everywhere. It's, it's very messy. The more code you write, the more the messier you will see in your code. And then it becomes unmanageable because Spark itself is not testable. It's, it's very hard to test. And uh, you will find your code is eaten up by Spark. 
And then in the end, you find your entire code is not manageable, not testable. And that, that, that's, that's very bad for production. You know, you just run things by luck. But in this approach, in the field approach, it encourages you to minimize the usage, minimize the dependency of the underlying framework, even the fugue itself, right? It encourages you to write native code as much as possible because that is testable, that is expressive, and that is portable, right? So that's the different philosophy of uh, fugue and spark. Yeah, and we do have um, like a um, decorator. For example, you can do this. You can do this. We, we do have this way. So if you don't like the schema hint, and then you can do things in this way. It's the same. It's the same. But uh, the cost is that you will have uh, dependency on the Fugue library in this way, right? Yeah, makes sense. OK, thank yeah. you. I think part of the question is also how you were able to parse the comments. Is that right, James? I, I'm also curious about that, but if you tell me other places do that, I can go Google that myself. Oh, OK, yeah, OK. You, yeah, you can look at uh, the our code base. Uh, it's not hard. Um, so the um, I think the inspect, um, the inspect uh, library of Python can do that, can give you the comments of the function. So. Yeah, I able to pass that. Yeah. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Okay. If there are no other questions, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Go ahead, Ricardo. Yeah. Is there any documentation for few? Yeah, yeah, there is documentation for Fugue. Um, okay. Could you post the link if you have it available? Yeah. Um, so if you go to the Fugue uh, okay, link, and then you will be able to see doc, right? Docs. Okay. Yeah. And here okay. is the, um, so I would suggest that instead of like looking um, at the document, I would suggest just go to the tutorials for mm -hmm. beginners. And there are many, uh, for example, we start with the hello world and right. then we directly go into a real case where mm -hmm. you can use Fugue to do sentiment analysis with an LTK. Um, as you can see, this is the same. Uh, we use we use a lot of like a schema hint instead of the uh, decorator itself because this way you can totally decouple from Fugue, right? And then actually the only part that's related with Fugue is just this small part, right? And here we also give you two, um, you know, this is how you represent your logic in a programming interface. And this is how you uh, uh, represent your logic in Fugue SQL. They are equivalent. Uh, actually, this is doing something more. Actually, this is doing some, something more. But they are, you know, it's just two equivalent representation, and you can choose whichever you feel comfortable with, right? Um, and uh, yeah, and here are a couple of like a more conceptual section where to talk about um, the execution graph and the type of extensions uh, and the basic ideas how to orchestrate them and the uh, pros and cons. So I, I would suggest that we directly go to tutorials and to follow the order of the tutorials to get a better idea of you. And also there are um, many, I have not, not many, but I try to publish the few related notebooks um, and those are, for example, uh, the uh, California traffic collisions. And you will see that it's, it's the same, it's the same. Uh, but you will see how I use uh, SQL, Fig SQL, to do the data analysis. Hmm. And actually, this one is not using Spark at all. 
This one is using native pandas plus SQLite. But again, you don't, you don't even know you are using SQLite. You don't even know you are using pandas. You just, you only write SQL. You only write SQL. Yeah, it will, it will do everything for you. And it's totally uh, platform agnostic. And uh, I also have uh, sentiment analysis. This one is using Spark, uh, where I also use a lot of Fuchs SQL, uh, but as well as uh, native uh, pandas, uh, Python. You can see that. Um, so I, I find that um, because this product, this Fug has been used in my company for real things. It's not a toy project. We do a lot of things in large scale. Um, and uh, so this idea is polished a lot um, in the last uh, one or two years. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot of reason to design things in this way because we do see a lot of use cases in this way. It's not something that, ah, I think it should be in this way and that is in this way. No, actually it's polished, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, so I will message out the documentation and I guess the notebooks also, along with like the video recording uh, at the end of the presentation. Are there any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'll just send those stuff out uh, and yeah, thank you, Han, for presenting and thank you, uh, yeah, and for being and for joining us today. Thank you. Bye.